Okay, we're live. So you had a whole lot of stuff, David, um, written down, all sorts of ideas on the rolling of dice and things. Hold on just a second. Okay, well, Tom, I'm sure will be back with us momentarily, but <laughs> I'm back. when he just raised quick. this topic, yeah, when he raised this topic, I just started jotting down some quick notes on a piece of paper uh, so I can sort of put some meat to my thoughts. And uh, wow, I think I ended up with 2000 words in this uh, document here. So I got a few things to think about. And the topic is uh, we were going to compare the MCDM role playing system to the Daggerheart role playing system to the existing D&D or you know, maybe to some extent the D&D system that's coming out in 2024 and sort of compare and contrast the places where these systems try and improve upon or provide a different experience to D&D. Right. And we've done, we've played all these games. So if you go to our D20 play channel, I have like a playlist that's play everything. And I've got the stuff we've done with Shadow Dark, including our interview with Kelsey, the stuff we've done with the MCDM. I've run it three times now, including with um, Treant Monk, ran in the game we played. And we had a good interview with James and Tregasso for that system. Although the system's changed a lot since we played it the first time. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And we right. played Daggerheart. And uh, I, asked, I reached out to Spencer Stark to see if he'd do an interview with us. So I'm still waiting to hear back from that. And then other systems like Crown and Skull, Hundred Dungeons, Kindle Del Obscura, etc. So yeah, it's a fun time to be playing D and D or playing any role playing game. There's so much on the horizon for games and such. So let's start talking about the different systems. Go ahead, David. If you're looking for fantasy games that sort of riff on that D and D play style, then now is an ideal time to be uh, to be in the hobby because there's a lot of games that are trying to do this or that better than D&D. And um, depending on your tastes, quite possibly succeeding. So the first thing I started thinking about with Daggerheart versus MCDM versus um, Dungeons and Dragons is the core mechanics of the three games. And the way I see it, um, the two newer games have core mechanics that um, are set up to address some of the common complaints, three common gripes that are leveled against the core mechanic in Dungeons and Dragons. That's a D&D &D role, add some sort of modifier and attempt to hit a difficulty right. class. So that's being used by, of course, D&D. &D. Uh, Shadow Dark uses it and, you know, tells the value uses it, it. Hey, Graham, thanks for joining us. Nice to have you on here. Uh, Graham's got 100 dungeons that he's done. Um, and so pretty ubiquitous system to roll d20, add modifiers compared to a difficulty check. And so talk about what the main gripes are on, those, on that is, David. OK, the three gripes that people try and address with these core mechanics or that we hear about quite a lot in the role playing community is First of all, that the D20 system does not provide various uh, degrees of success. It's a binary success or failure system. Second of all, the system can provide some feel bad moments, especially in combat, where you wait 10 minutes, 20 minutes for your turn to come up. You're eager to finally step in the action and then you roll a miss and your turn feels like it's wasted because nothing came about from it. And third is the swinginess of the D20 mechanic that makes uh, that can make experts look inept and zeros, average characters, look like heroes if they happen to roll uh, high. And we'll kind of unpack that a little bit later. But first, I'd like to talk about the degrees of success. Um, so both Daggerheart and MCDM attempt to set up systems where 
the system provides different degrees of success or different degrees of failure. And Daggerheart does that with their hope and fear mechanic, where you roll two D12s. One of them's a hope die and the other one's a fear die. And you can succeed because success or failure is based on whether you exceed that target number with the sum of the two dice. But depending on what die is higher, your roll also comes with hope or fear. Um, what did you think of that? Did you think it was playing it? Was it overwhelming? Was it like you're constantly messing with it and tweaking with your hope, tweaking with your fear? Uh, would, is it a good mechanic to a lesser extent? Or was it fine the way they did it in your thoughts? I thought it was OK. I thought it okay. played all right. It's going to take some getting used to. And it's interesting for a DM who's playing the non-combat parts of the game where you know a, a result of on the, the role that's a role with fear is kind of like success or potentially failure with complications. So with success, with fear, that's kind of a fair fail forward state where you've got success, but you also have complications that are added on. And then um, failure with fear is similar, but it's even worse because you're not going necessarily going forward at all. Um, outside of combat, that weighs the dungeon master with a little bit extra duty because they've got to improvise setbacks or complications to the, the outcome of the role as things go along. Um, I haven't game mastered a game like that where you have have that sort of duty to improvise and i've heard other dms or game masters i should say say they've tried it and it doesn't weigh as much as you would think because they, they always had an easy time improvising something to go wrong but um it, it makes me a little nervous about trying to uh game master dagger heart how did how did you feel about that yeah i felt it so I like a game to go really fast as a player, as a DM. And it really felt to me like it slowed it down. It weighed it down. There's so many things we were doing outside of making that feel cinematic. It feels like anti-cinematic to me. But, <laughs> you know, maybe when you slow the game down like that to add in those little things, some people think of that as more cinematic, more free-flowing. Sure didn't feel like that to me. I'm... Definitely didn't feel rules light like they stay say here. Um, doesn't use grid based movement, but then it's just kind of abstract. But I felt like it was kind of a neat mechanic to have hope and fear, but maybe not on every single roll. Maybe some sort of like throttling of that where it might happen one out of every four rolls or something like that. I would feel a little bit better about it. Um, that was just my preference as a DM. And I think my preference as a player is like, I want. I want to come back around to my turn so fast. I'm like, wait, it's my turn already. That's how yeah. I like combat to flow. And so it seemed to me had some cool mechanics, but they need to be kind of throttled back a little bit would be my preference or my recommendation for the dagger heart game system. Shadow dark, you know, is just instantly fast. Uh, D and D at higher levels get slower because you get multiple attacks. So many powers every character can do. Um, MCDM is interesting. We'll get to that in a little bit. Interesting in, you know, its scope of what it's trying to do, but it feels like it's just maybe going to go a lot faster. And Daggerheart, and we'll talk about this when we get to um, MCDM too, they kind of seem to go different directions from D&D. So D&D is a mechanic where you roll to hit and you do damage. Um, Daggerheart, they add, they still have a roll to hit, now you're doing damage, but now you're comparing it to armor, and you might throttle back the damage a little bit. Then you're comparing it to um, different thresholds where you might take stress or you might take hits. And it made it much more on the complex side, whereas like MCDM made it even more abstract. You don't have armor class. That just goes into your hit points. So you just basically have hit points, and that's it. Um, and they give you armor where it increases your hit points, which is an interesting idea. It's like you could make... You know, con normally increases your hit points in D&D. You could have dexterity and con increase your hit points in MCDM or any system that did it that way. And armor class increase your hit points. Um, but yeah, so a big difference in those two. Sorry, 
<laughs> I said a lot for one question you had there. So keep going, David. If there's any part of Daggerheart that defies that goal of being rules, rules light, it's the damage system. Wow, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. And um, uh, I'm not entirely sure whether all of it adds to the play experience, but I think I need to play it more to understand. So Graham says, I do find it can get a little exhausting coming up with complications all the time in Blades in the Dark and Powered by the Apocalypse, which is a system that uses the, the degrees of success that MCDM is checking out. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I felt. It's like it's a full-time job dealing with that mechanic as opposed to what's in the world happening, you know, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Graham said, this really underlines the need to not call for a role if they're, yeah. So Daggerheart, with every roll doing something, you really need to not roll when you don't need a roll. <laughs> it's real important. <laughs> in, de in defense of the hope and fear balance in Daggerheart um, and the complications that ensue, uh, in the part of the game where you're making the most rolls in the combat part of the game, the setbacks and complications and bonuses are all pretty much baked into the system, starting with the fact that um, initiative passes to the game master when one of the players um, rolls a fear result. Yeah. So you don't have to quite improvise all that stuff, but it, yeah. it's there. Adam says that I don't need to see any reason you can't just fall back on lots of stamina for a fear roll. And it's interesting that Adam's saying loss of stamina because that's another thing gripe i had with dagger heart is they didn't call it stamina they called it stress and they counted it in the reverse direction you'd be assuming for things so they had hope going up better stress going up bad hits going up bad just change stress to stamina and make everything being high you have a lot of hit points is good a lot of stamina is good a lot of hope is good and then count it down it would have simplified things a little bit and made it better for starting players yeah uh, smart yeah and then let's see we have uh zach here hi zach i feel like degrees of success are great on paper we'll see what he thinks about that later and then graham said in dd i felt like there are degrees of success but they're offloaded into the scenario design rather than the core mechanic yeah i mean you can put the dc's degrees of this of success right you can say a dc 20 but if you got a dc 10 something else happens yeah, so you that, see that sometimes in the yeah. system and sometimes even with things like uh, paralyzation and turning to stone, and yeah. if, if my memory serves. Yeah. Well, let's talk a minute about uh, the MCDM core mechanic. Okay. And it's changed a little bit since the yeah, big change. play test that we played. It's still a 2D6 mechanic. They call it the power roll mechanic. And depending on the outcome of the role is how great a success you uh, you experienced. And they call the degrees of success uh, tier one, tier two, tier three. I might have stolen a page from the Marvel superheroes role-playing game from the 90s and called it uh, good success, excellent success, and remarkable success. But um, I'm sure it's still... Uh, in development yeah this looks really interesting to me so um what it used to have was you roll um damage and it's a spectrum of damage and you could have modifiers to that damage and you do one thing and D, &D is the same way where D, D you have one effect when you hit and that effect doesn't vary the damage varies but the effect doesn't vary Whereas, uh, and the same thing with MCDM, whereas you'd roll your damage and then it'd vary, but the effect would not vary. What using this power roll system does, and I think this comes from Powered by the Apocalypse, is you compare your roll to like tiers, and then you can vary not only the damage, but the effect of the roll. And here's an example of Brutal Slam where it's doing that. Um, I can't wait to get the next iteration of the MCDM's playtest. I think they're talking about Q2, like, maybe late Q2, and we'll see that. So that'll be a lot of fun to try that out, for sure. And I have some, like, comparisons here. Let me see if I can share this screen. First, let me get to some comments. Okay, let me see if I can share now. Keep going, keep on going, David, while I pull this up. Okay, well, you've got the degrees of success depending on your die roll on this power roll mechanic. 
the system has two kinds of power roles. There's ability roles, which sort of correspond to D&D's attack roles, and tests, which confusingly enough sort of correspond to D&D's ability checks. Um, ability roles, these attack roles, don't have a chance of failure. And that brings us to a second common gripe leveled at uh, the D&D's core D20 mechanic. And that's that bit about the down moments you experience when you miss on an attack and possibly feel like you wasted your turn. Uh, so in, in um, MCDM, all ability roles succeed with an outcome that only determines the degree of success, including the amount of damage. The system just takes out the damage roles entirely, like D&D does in fifth edition, though most many people don't play that way. Um, so without the damage rolls, the system plays faster. And with the mechanic, no one actually misses on a turn, though you can have a sort of low damage result. But here's the thing in play. It sounds good in principle, but the, the fact that you can't fail on an ability check one of these attack rolls, to me, it made the game feel less compelling. And I think the reason comes down to something psychologists call intermittent reinforcement. That's that feeling that every so often you get a good outcome and that gives you a little boost of serotonin. That's intermittent uh, reinforcement is will, what built all the casinos along the Las Vegas Strip. <laughs> and that's the reason no one would ever play a slot machine that exactly matches the odds and returns 97 cents for every time you drop a dollar and pull the lever. It's just not fun. Um, to be fair, the version of MCDM that we played uh, used a slightly different mechanic where you just rolled damage. So most attacks sort of landed in that middling result. Uh, the new mechanic uh, could potentially allow bigger results for big rolls and may feel a little bit different in play. Let's take a look at that mechanic again that they were talking about. So share this. So yeah, so the Brutal Slam, you know, 2d6 plus an ability modifier. So being one, two, or three on your might ability modifier. And if you have a positive modifier, you're not going to get the low result very often. We'll look at the percentages here in a second. Um, and their ability modifiers were going up to plus three for a new character, I think. And they might tweak that down now that they're using this kind of mechanic. So three damage plus push one for the low roll, eight plus push two, 12 plus push four for the high roll. And they talked about how this damage scale could go with um, really big hitting weapons, be a broader range and damage scale. Mm -hmm. And with small little weapons, it could be a tighter range and damage scale. Now, I did a quick look at what the odds are. Let me share that. Let's see if we can see that. There we go. OK, so looking at the odds here, this is a 2d6 system on the left with a range of 2 to 7, 8 to 10, 11 plus. So with no modifier in the roll, 58% of the time you get the low roll. But since most of your characters are going to have a modifier in their good stuff of plus 2, plus 3, your chance of getting the low rolls drop into like a quarter or less than a quarter of the time. Um, your chance of getting the big roll is climbing quickly to where it's a quarter of the time at plus two, almost 50% of the time at plus three. So that might feel like you're saying, David, like too often you're getting the good roll. Not sure exactly. Interestingly, this kind of tier thing you can do with any dice system. You do it 2d6, 2d8, a d20, 2d20. You just pick the ranges you want to use. And I just did it with a d20, straight d20 roll. And if you did 1 through 12 and 13 through 18 and 19 plus, the odds are about the same, 60%, 30%, 10% of those versus the uh, 2d6 rolls. And the damage output, I just took the average damage of 2, 5, and 10 for the different tiers. It's very similar if you do the bonuses halved for 2d6 and doubled for d20. So on a d20, a plus 2, it's going to give you an average of 4.5 damage. A plus one on D two D six gives you four point five eight damage, and plus two is five point five, and then plus four on D twenty is five point three. And 
uh, James talked about this in the video that he did that went along with the, the introduction of the system. And let's see if we have it here in this. So we share this tab instead. And he started talking about, you know, they had an advantage disadvantage system where you'd roll extra D6s. But the problem there was if you have different opponents that you have advantage on, but you're making one roll, how do you do that? And also it became very weighted uh, real fast. And as you can see from those odds ch charts, you really just want to be getting plus one, minus one with a 2d6 system. I'd argue if you're doing a d20 system of the same thing, you do plus two, minus two. Um, but yeah, so they, that's what they're working with on their internal play tests. I think it's going to be pretty interesting to try it out. Yeah, I like the direction. It's a nice mechanic. And yeah. uh, it okay. also addresses, go ahead. We have some more chats here. So Graham says he loves that point about intermittent reinforcement. Uh, I often think swinginess and chance of failure are overall good for the game. I think they are, as long as you can really go fast. Um, hold on just a second. Go ahead, David. All right. Well, let's talk about swinginess a little bit. Both Daggerheart and MCDM use a system where you roll two dice and total the result to find out what your outcome is. MCDM, it's 2D6. In Daggerheart, it's 2D12. Both of the games have a good reason to avoid the single D20 roll that you find in D&D. &D. Uh, when you roll two dice and sum the results, like, uh, like in those tables Tom was sharing, you get a nice bell curve where the numbers in the middle you're more likely to hit than the extreme results at the end. With the D20 roll, the extreme results are just as likely to come up as the sort of middle results in the uh, middle of the span. And that, that swinginess contributes to the sort of wacky outcomes that you see all the times in D&D &D games where the mighty feud barbarian slams into a door, rolls a two and bounces off then moments later, the pencil-necked gnome wizard kicks the door, rolls a 20, and the door crashes open. Um, with a d20 roll, the roll swamps the influence of a character's abilities unless you give characters very high modifiers. But that has its own perils, because if you start giving characters with modifiers like plus 15 or something, modifiers that we would routinely see in third edition, uh, that stands out from the average characters. But then if you want to challenge those characters with plus 15 or plus 20, you've got to set difficulty classes like 30, which is something that average characters can't reach at all, ever, even with yeah. the luckiest die roll. So it creates a sort of uncomfortable dynamic that's not particularly fun. And you got to come up with weird story reasons why things get harder. Like, hey, climbing this ladder is a DC five when you're first level, but now it's a demon infested, fiery ladder with spikes on it, and so it's a DC thirty at you know twentieth level. Exactly. It's just kind of dumb. I just think, and it, that goes into don't make rolls for things that should be, you know, easy to do. But what you're talking about with the swinginess and the modifiers, very interesting. The two D six system, which has much less, you know, broadness for the results. Small modifiers quickly just get out of hand. Once you get up to plus five, once you get to plus six, you never fail. Yeah. Because two is your low roll, plus six, you got an eight. So you never right. fail with plus six or higher. And whereas the D20 system, you'd have to, you know, one through 12 being the same odds at plus zero modifier, it's only getting better by 5% every plus. So you got to get to plus 11 to have no chance of, uh, no, plus 12 to have no chance of failure. And so I didn't really like fourth edition, like you're saying, for those reasons where the modifiers got crazy. I think Pathfinder is the same way where the mm -hmm. modifiers just get crazy. Um, some more comments here. So Graham says, I, so yeah, we already got that one. And then uh, Matt says, MCDM has said that you start at level one as a hero. I prefer in D&D you start relatively weak and need to earn your way being heroic. Yeah, the games that start you off being a real strong hero kind of take that away from you. Play some Shadow Dark, then you won't feel like a hero. <laughs> You'll have like David's third level thief with three hit points. Yeah, that'll cure you in a hurry. <laughs> that'll cure your hero hero aspirations in a hurry. Uh, I love Shadow Dark. I'm not not disparaging Shadow Dark. Also, Absolutely. for some reason, I like ability scores being three to eighteen instead of plus one, plus two, plus three. I can't explain why. Yeah, I mean, once you make that 
the modifiers like that. You don't get that fun rolling for ability scores. I mean, ability scores are only what the plus one, plus two, plus three are in the current system. It's not like second edition or other systems where you have to roll your modifier or your actual ability score to get a, get a check. Okay, go ahead, David. Well, let's talk a little bit about a tangent to the mechanics now that we've dealt with the three big gripes. Uh, that's advantage and disadvantage. And we all love how fifth edition's advantage and disadvantage mechanic streamlines all the fiddly plus one and plus two modifiers that we saw in older editions of the game. It also removes all those stacking rules that we used to see where we'd learn what modifiers could stack with what other ones. And it all got kind of out of hand, especially considering that D20 die roll swamped all those modifiers anyway. Um, so advantage and disadvantage is, an, is a, most of us see as a plus. Uh, an improvement. But on the other hand, um, it's kind of a blunt adjustment. Um, and, and, and one thing I don't like about advantage and disadvantage as it is in D&D is the way if it all washes out together. So if you've got advantage and disadvantage and maybe a few sources of advantage, it all kind of disappears. And that means that if you've got some sort of consistent source of advantage, say like cover or the foresight spell, a lot of tactical considerations, a lot of choices that you make in the game no longer matter. Well, I'll talk about cover in a second. Cover is, is an exception. Um, but, you know, foresight and other things that can consistently provide advantage sort of wash out all the other uh, choices that your character could make to gain advantage or, or avoid disadvantage. And um, I don't particularly like that. Um, and that's why cover typically imposes a minus two penalty rather than imposing disadvantage on attackers. It's because the designers didn't want cover something so easy to get to just sort of wash out their whole advantage and disadvantage system. That's a good observation because both Daggerheart and MCDM are are stacking them and only offsetting them one to one. Mm -hmm. uh, MCDM was toying with only going up to a maximum of double, double advantage, double disadvantage. Um, Daggerheart does it the um, God, what's I'm sure you know the game system. Um, they do it where they get you get multiple advantages, you get multiple d6s that you get to add, but you only take the highest. Yeah, yeah. And um, MCDM, going back to just modifiers, and I kind of like this, you know, it's like in D&D, &D, like you're saying, all advantages are offset by one disadvantage, but they kept cover because they knew they, they didn't like that in that regard. I kind of like just you get plus ones, you get plus minus ones, and you just add them up, and that's it. Right, um, yeah. And, yeah. And the plus ones and minus ones, they're low enough numbers, and they're easy enough to deal with that... It doesn't feel as burdensome. I remember some D and D competitions that we used to be in, where roles were really critical, and we just sit there trying to wring out every plus we could <laughs> to retroactively bring a die roll over this whatever number we thought we needed, and it just slowed the game to a crawl. It was yeah. memorable because I remember it, but it wasn't maybe all that fun. Yeah. All right, you want to talk about death and dying? You got that? What's what's next on your list there? Next, I got initiative, and we're going oh, to yeah. talk about yeah. pacing here just Let's a little bit. Let's talk about initiative. That's a good one. Okay, so we've both Daggerheart and MCDM attempt to improve on D and D cyclical initiative system. That's where everybody rolls a D twenty or some other die, and the high number goes first, and the low number goes last, and you never roll again. Um, an MCDM characters can go in any order as decided by the players. And then the game master gets a turn after each of the characters turn. And you kind of like that system, right? I did like that because what it did that D and D doesn't do is lets the big bad enemies go early in the combat before most of the characters go. So they can really, you know, feature, 
you know, their attacks, their cool powers and that stuff. Often the D D, they're going last. They're going dead last. They got all the characters before them. They're almost wiped out in round one. You got to put special things on them to get them to survive, or make sure you somehow get minions out there at the start before the party even knows they're there, so that the party wastes their attacks on the minions. Um, so I did like that. I did not like, uh, and both Daggerheart and MC at DM do this, where it's like the party decides the order every round. I feel like that can just lead to wasted time i like it i like knowing my turn's coming up and i launch into my turn as a player you know i know i'm next and i'm ready to go as opposed to well the mo- i'm waiting for the monster to finish and then we're gonna have a debate about who's that who's next after that yeah let's talk about that friction yeah. in a moment yeah um, but first let's talk about dagger heart which ha- has an even looser system than mcdm because not only do the players decide when they want to go but they can decide to go twice or go as many times as the rules allow in a sequence. And presumably you could have one player take all the turns and just um, win Daggerheart for yeah. you. Yeah. Hey, I'm the sharpshooter. You guys don't even need to go. Exactly. I'll just take turn. <laughs> now, of course, I'm sure most DMs would try and step in and help that. For sure. I for sure would. But it seems odd for it to be the default. The default yeah. is you can just go as many times as you want. The DM has to force you not to. Or I sus- you just have to be a good player. I suspect that the designers intended to enable the sort of heroic moments where characters can string actions together into sequences that feel cinematic and feel uninterrupted without little six-second segments of time breaking up the action and you having to wait 10 minutes of real time for everyone else's turn to go before you can complete that heroic moment that you were aiming for. And imagine, I imagine they're hoping that, that that can really add to sort of the cinematic fun of heroic moments. Yeah, and I definitely see that kind of play in Critical Role's, you know, video and we've had that kind of play in home games where it's like every turn's kind of a strategy session but that gets old fast it can be fun sometimes like zach saying the debate's fun the debate is fun sometimes when you're strategizing together about what to do next as a group okay you should do that then i'll do this and you do that um so i think that's what they're going for right yeah and as a dm you just got to watch the pacing make sure you don't let it bog down really Yeah, and that goal doesn't always happen. That's what we learned in play. Because if you roll with fear on one of your checks, then the initiative passes back to the DM and the the GM uh, gets a chance to jump in and interrupt that cinematic heroic moment. So there is a trade-off there and and the system might might intrude. Yeah, and I felt like obviously there's a flaw in the system with regard to like versimilitude, right? Because if you have twice as many enemies as you have players or half as many enemies as you have players, then not everyone will go before people are going again, Mm -hmm. which doesn't feel right in, in theory. Um, And so that's one drawback with the system. And just like the sharpshooter character can go over and over and over, the big bad guy can go over and over and over, which also doesn't feel right. So I didn't like it in a lot of regards. Uh, Matt says, with looser initiative parties might find optimal combos that could make combat repetitive. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this discussion has made me wonder about an initiative system where the boss always goes first, and then the players decide their own initiative after that. Both sides then get an optimal round. That might be playing right into something That's you think about, Dave. Shadow of the Demon Lord or uh-huh. Shadow of the Weird Wizard. That's that's how their initiative system goes. And you can sacrifice a little bit of your action to mm-hmm. jump ahead of the bad guys. But by default, the bad guys always go first because that's how badass they are. <laughs> and yeah, it, it plays really great. I loved it. Yeah, I imagine it would go pretty fast. I mean, um, another system that by default, I don't play it this way, but by default, Shadow Dark just goes like in a circular around the table pattern. Uh, it doesn't necessarily start with the bad guy. It can start with anyone. But then 
it's real fast, but the players are often going in a big chunk together. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, that leads into my, um, my uh, main point about the initiative system in both these games, which has to do with something you talked about, Tom, the speed of play. And let me go off on a little tangent about the initiative system in Dungeons and Dragons. For third editions, most D&D groups used sided initiatives. So the player with and the DM each rolled a die and the side with, side with the best roll went first. Most tables, they rolled initiative every round. Um, all that added some exciting in uncertainty, but it also added some friction. Uh, lead designer at the time of third edition, Jonathan Tweet says, it takes forever to go through the round because no one knows who's next and people get dropped. So the third edition team decided to try a rule that originated in some West Coast D&D variants like the Warlock rules devised at Tal Caltech and the Perrin conventions created by future RuneQuest designer and D&D contributor Steve Perrin. Um, that variant was cyclical edition initiative, the initiative system we're all familiar with, where everyone rolls to establish and the order stays the same throughout the fight. Um, so Jonathan Tweet said, it feels more like combat because it's faster. By the end of the turn, by the end of five hours of playing D&D, you've had way more fun because things have gone faster. Monty Cook said, if you look at something that happens 20, 30, 50 times during a game session and eliminate that or decrease it hugely, you're going to make the game run faster, more smoothly. That's the idea of how uh, that idea is a big part of my game designer toolbox. So here's the, here's the notion behind all that. If you make initiative faster, if you make deciding whose turn comes up a lot faster, that saves a lot of time discussion and who goes next and no after you, no after you kind of stuff that slows down and adds friction to the game. And it just makes things faster. And that speed of play is why fifth edition's initiative system dropped almost all the decision-making that was even available in past editions. So you can't even delay anymore. That's a deliberate restriction to speed the pace of combat. So it might feel a little less cinematic, but it certainly feels faster in play. Yeah, I 100% agree. Nothing makes me feel better as a DM. Well, Killing Familiars is up there, but second <laughs> to that is when a player is surprised it's their turn again already. I feel like I'm doing a good job. The pacing is going well. When the player's, wait, it's my turn again already? I love that. Yeah, I love it. Um, so all these systems where the players get a debate every round, as a player, every I can't turn. stand it. <laughs> As a player, I hate it because, like, I'm ready to go. Just tell me to go and I'll go. You know, I don't want to have a debate every single time. So, uh, Matt says you can always try the youngest goes first option. Uh, Graham says, um, honestly, around the table initiative is great. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a set order. You know, your turn's coming. It's easier to not skip people that way, too, right? Because when it's um, you roll initiative and it's kind of a random order of who's going around the table, so you won't, you won't miss people this way. Yeah. Um, so those are really good points that, what was it, Tweet and Cook brought up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we're talking about game systems right now that are not done, right? We got Daggerheart mm -hmm. and we got MCDM both in playtest. And hopefully they'll consider how can they speed that up? I don't see MC, I don't see Daggerheart thinking about how they're going to speed theirs up because um, it really matches how Critical Role plays. If you watch a critical role game, they really like that and how they play. Um, but MCDM, MCDM's even kind of acknowledged that uh, that it can be a problem. You know, they talk about an argument timer. Yes. And an exactly. alternate initiative system. And so hopefully that will maybe go to be the actual system. Just yeah, I think a light order. touch improvement to MCDM would be at the beginning of it round have everyone put their little tokens in the pool in the middle mm -hmm. and then as the round goes on you move your token to the dm side as you take your turns and then everybody knows who's taking a turn 
how the progress is going. And the DM kind of accumulates those tokens to use as actions for their creatures when somebody rolls a fear. But you're talking, you said MCDM, but you're talking Dagger Heart, right? I'm talking Dagger Heart. Yeah. That's what okay. I should have should have <laughs> said. So just search and replace that. Yeah. Okay. What's next on your list there, Dave? Well, let's talk about combat escalation. And this, okay. uh, unlike some of those initiative systems, is something that I think is a big improvement in both systems. Uh, in D&D now, major battles typically start with all the characters unleashing their most powerful spells and abilities and a big nova of attack. And sometimes that turns climactic showdowns into anticlimactic beatdowns, especially if, as you were saying, the bad guy gets bad initiative and tends to and lands at the bottom of the order. And then as the fight wears on, all these depleted characters start grinding with basic attacks and cantrips. And instead of rising excitement, the game just sputters into this grind. Both um, MCDM and Daggerheart give resources that can rise during combat. In MCDM, it's the various heroic resources like rage and in Daggerheart, it's hope. Both of these things you can spend to power up your attacks and your abilities. And this helps create a science sense of escalation in battle, of rising action instead of sputtering out. Um, meanwhile, the growing stack of fear tokens that the game master might collect in Daggerheart also adds a gr growing sense of peril. I, I think yep. these mechanics make a great um, change from what D and D currently has in their design. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. The MCDM system was really cool. How you? They're both really cool. How you build up? Now, I think Daggerheart, you carry hope over, and you carry you carry everything over. Unlike MCDM, where you build it up every every encounter, you build up every encounter stuff, but then you also carry stuff over in MCDM. So maybe in Daggerheart, if they would have some way to build up during an encounter as well as carrying over that might help a little bit but yeah and i don't see i don't know that there's any optional rule in D D. now 13th age has an optional rule where they have a escalation die and monsters hit harder and players hit harder as the rounds go on so that's kind of something you probably could bring into into D, &D but for sure definitely not there in the base system not there in any of the Dungeon Master's Guide, um, no optional rules. Maybe that's something they could add in for, they should certainly think about it because they're right now they're writing it. Some way to do an escalation in D&D is at least an optional rule. Currently with D&D, they actually design characters with an intent that they can Nova. That's kind of a class feature that they design for that they think creates cool moments for the players. So you get characters like, the samurai and you know you might have heard of paladins but um i don't know that that's a healthy design direction for yeah. them to explore yeah but they don't listen to me so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh mcdm also kind of presses this uh design very deliberately and they've even got a resource called victories that you earn as you win fights through the course of your adventuring day and as you get more victories your characters get stronger and i love it because instead of encouraging a five minute adventuring day the system encourages players to test their limits as if they were real heroes yeah yeah i really do like that system and that doesn't quite exist in Daggerheart, not not near to the extent that it existed in MCDM. And there's really no comparison in D&D &D to that. In D&D, &D, you're just grinding down. At no point do you start getting better during a day. OK, Tom, choose one, ability scores or death and dying. Let's look at death and dying. OK, another great feature from both systems and I hope you can highlight those yeah. systems on your screen there. Um, in D&D, &D, dropping to zero hit points is easy, at least in the current 
iterations of DD. But dying, except at first level, is nearly impossible. Yeah. This makes um, difficult fights in the sort of unintentionally comical scenes where characters keep flopping to the ground, presumably at death's door, only to be revived again and again. And no one's particularly concerned about the characters dropping around them. The rules even encourage a counterintuitive strategy where players refuse to heal their friends until they lie dying because damage below zero hit points heals for free. Yeah, uh, you know that whole dynamic robs the game of any sense of peril from going near death. And then, if you defy the odds and a character actually dies during the game, um, instead of getting a big blaze of glory moment, you end up with three turns doing nothing but failing death saves, where your character bleeds into the dirt which is the least fun way to lose the character imaginable. Yeah. So I love how both Daggerheart and MCDM have rules for characters who are near death or on death's door where they get to go out in a blaze of glory if they so choose yep. or potentially have a serious complication in Daggerheart where you might have a scar or some sort yeah. of other major setback. There's an, there's an interesting disparity between the two, right? MCDM has one way. Daggerheart has an option, and it's the player's option, which right. I think is pretty interesting. But and that ties into the whole narrative feel, that whole storytelling feel that mm -hmm. uh, Daggerheart is trying to achieve with the rule set. Yeah, so MCDM here, Unbalanced and Death. When your health drops to zero or lower, you're unbalanced, and you can't take... Your recovery, you can't self heal yourself. And whenever you take a test using a physical characteristic or make an attack, you're going to take some health. It's interesting because it basically gives you like this buffer zone of hit points where you can do less stuff, but you can still do stuff. And then you just die outright when you get down to half your health. Um, so that's one way, but I really like Dagger Art. Share this tab instead, where they give you three different options. And I was surprised at how gritty and dangerous these options are. I was figuring Dagger would just be, oh, don't worry, you can still play. Nothing bad happens. But they, they kind of went hardcore on this. Um, embrace death and go out in a blaze of glory. That's You just get one more action, and it's auto crit. And then you, and then you die. I'll skip avoid death. Come to here and risk it all. 50-50 chance that you live um, or die. And then the avoid death is kind of what D&D has, where you go unconscious. And this is the thing about D&D that um, MCDM doesn't have with the system they have is you kind of have a protection mechanism built into D&D. Because when you get down to zero and you're not unconscious, normally things will start having to fight other, other people that are attacking them. And they won't focus still on you when you're down and dying and kill you outright. So you're like got this built-in protection. Um, and MCN doesn't have that because you're still up and fighting, albeit not as well. And they'll take you down to negative half your points and just kill you. In uh, in Daggerheart, so you can do this thing where you drop unconscious and you're just out for the rest of the fight. And that seems like, oh, well, you, that's you know no risk there. But what they have you do is roll a check to see if you get a scar. And these scars build up really rapidly and really badly because what they do is they offset your maximum amount of hope, which is a resource you can use to spend big powers. And pretty soon you get less and less hope and your character kind of feels, you know, really crippled in that way. And it'll be time to retire them and bring a new character in pretty quick if you go that route. Right. So it's not toothless in any sense. This is not, not the tune game from the 80s where, you know, a knockout just meant you were out for, until you appeared next turn. Um, it's it's got some teeth and I and I like it. Yeah, I mean, of course, D and D and Shadow Dark. I don't know that D and D actually has these options built into it somewhere. Uh, Shadow Dark, you can say, oh, well, there's points you're dead, or there's a number of other things like that. Shadow Dark suffers with its basic rules like D and D, where you go unconscious and you're just there dying. So that's probably the rule I like the least of all the death and dying rules. So hopefully they'll add some options there in Five E um, in that regard.
yeah, I'd like to see it. If I were king of D and D, I'd certainly be cribbing these games' papers. But yep. you know, this is why we have different games to have different yeah. exciting options of play styles. Yeah. And um, I don't know what you got next to your list, but maybe I can sneak one in here. Have at is, it. Is um, how complete these play tests were from these two different companies, and how different a tactic they're taking. So MCDM, it was not very complete. And it feels like they're making very big, swingy changes in their design. Um, and whereas Daggerheart felt like they had a whole bunch of like the world described in their playtest. <laughs> yes, it was three hundred pages long, um, and it doesn't feel to me like they're going to want to change it very much, right? So if there's things I don't like there, I get the feeling it might not change much. Uh, so you got that two real different distinct styles in these playtests. And then of course there's the D and D playtest, which is, shall I say it? Uh, do you like this piece of candy that we're going to give you or this piece of candy that we're going to give you? <laughs> Harsh, <laughs> sorry, but fair. But, <laughs> sorry, but that's what it felt like. Well, what candy Completely. do you like more? Yeah. Which, which of these candies do you like the best? Oh, we'll give you both. Never mind. No, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't like that at all. Um, Alpha stream in the chat. Hi, Teos. If you are level zero for Shutter Dark, you just die. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. I did a Shutter Dark adventure, um, and I made a video of the 18 different character deaths in the adventure, because it was one of those, you know, level zero grinder adventures. Um, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about first level characters in the three systems. Obviously, okay. yeah, Shadow probably. Dark characters are soap bubbles. Um, first yep. level D and D characters are still pretty much soap bubbles. Which you can get a... the instant death. You can yeah. do you know their negative hit points in damage and kill them outright. Still pretty often. Yeah, and ironically, that greets new players to the game with the <laughs> game play experience at its most dangerous. Yeah, the most lethal. Here, your first level, you risk death. These 10th level characters, they will never die. There is no chance no that chance. they die unless there's a <laughs> TPK and nobody's standing to revive the other guys. Yep. Um, and, and both MCDM and... Daggerheart make new characters fairly durable. That's something we saw in fourth edition and definitely lost in fifth edition. And I think that's a pretty good approach. I've always liked to have first level characters, unless I'm going for the Shadow Dark play experience, which I love too. But, you know, in a DD &D game where you're spending potentially hours making a new character, I don't want soap bubbles. I want yeah. uh, I want a little bit of stoutness, or make new characters in D and D a little faster. And they're not going that route, unfortunately. They are definitely not going they're that going route. With, you know, more feats, more time to build this character. I would love to see a first and second level tier in D and D that was just dirt simple. You could get your character out in no time at all and start playing. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can always take a pre gen, but no one wants to play pre gen. So I want to roll up a character and play it. So. So I, I totally applaud the D&D &D team when they show up at conventions and run tables. That's awesome. But I can tell that these guys have never sat down with a table full of new players who have never played the game and tried to introduce um, the new characters to them. They're just overly complicated. They don't need to be so complicated. And I think it's been going in the wrong direction with that. Yeah. Uh, Teo says, um, if you were making an RPG, what tiers of play low, mid, high would you make the most lethal? Um, Definitely low would be the least lethal. And then the hard thing about D&D &D in general is that it feels like you have a lot invested in your character and you feel really bad, unless you're playing with players that are, you know, don't mind that style of play, you feel really bad killing a whole party of high level characters because they spent a lot of time on that character. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and it probably derails the campaign. That's why yeah, you start the campaign over. Yeah. I, I, you know, I kind of suggest plan B's for high level characters. Yeah. You know, most of us have done it where the characters are knocked out and taken, con uh, taken captive. You've done it to us, Tom. 
oh, I've yeah. done it to players. And then you get a new adventure where you're captive. We all dream of doing that to a party of characters mm -hmm. where they're captive and they've got to escape. This is a fun scenario to play. It's a fun yeah. scenario to DM. And yeah, so that's you can't huge... do it artificially. It's got to come naturally or your players yeah. will hate you. That's really good advice, though, David, to be thinking of the alternatives to the DPK ahead of the adventure. And that way, as a DM, when you know there's, you know, the party gets captured or something happens, somehow they'll, they're going to survive. Then you play the adventure with your foot on the pedal. The party knows you're not softballing them. And I think it feels better as a player. I hate it as a player when I know the DM softballing. It's like, oh, shoot, we're probably all going to die here. But the DM's, you know, not going to kill us. That just doesn't feel good when I when I play. Um, I don't mind making new characters and stuff. So I guess that might be different that way. But it feels a lot better when the DM can just put their foot down and steamroll by, <laughs> steamroll the party. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and when that's going on, you can get some of the most amazing recoveries too. Like when we were in uh, Fandelver and Below, and we're down to one character alive and one twenty on a death save, and two rounds later, the whole party's alive. And yeah, the one just... character that was actually dead, dead, got revivified. I've never seen a comeback like that, and never would have happened if I wasn't just going to kill you all and take you know prisoners of the ones that lived through it. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, Graham mm -hmm. says, "May I recommend Hundred Dungeons for Levels One, Two? Refresh my memory, Graham. What did you do for level one and two to make it survivable? Uh, let us know in the chat there. And then Graham says, I love Teos' this question. I'd love to see a deadly high tier. They can get resurrected. Yeah. So deadly high level play, the way I do deadly high level play now, and I, I used to do it where I did it with like bags of hit points, but that would get boring. The problem is the high level monsters don't hit hard, nearly hard enough. These characters, once they're 15th level and above in D&D are just super heroic. They can do amazing things that they never get the chance to do because they never face the real adversity. So I started basically taking and multiplying the damage output of my monsters by uh, consistent with their proficiency bonus. So once a monster got a proficiency bonus of, um, once they're above CR1, CR2 or above, I do 1.2 times their damage output if they proficiency bonus of two. Once they're up to proficiency bonus of seven, I do 1.7 times the damage output. So I'd be getting red dragons breathing on the party for 150 hit points of damage with the breath weapon. But then the party gets the shine because they can take it. And the players can't believe they can take it until they do. You know, until they know, oh, I have this armor that gives me resistance to fire. Oh, I have this portion of fire resistance. Oh, and I'm a thief and I just ignore it completely. And then, yeah. or and I got Death Ward on me as a cleric, and yeah, I'm down to one, but then I'll do a heal, healing, heal spell, and I'm back up to full. And they never but, get to do that. Yeah, those yeah. DC 75 concentration checks are a bitch. <laughs> that I gotta a say. <laughs> that, so great, I, my recommendation for a high level DD is just ramp up the damage. Yeah, I mean, the great thing about high level DD is you can absolutely pull out all the stops as a dungeon master. And show no mercy whatsoever and still watch and be fans of the characters as they yep. bounce back and pull yep. those heroic moments. I was running my demon walker of the abyss, a battle walker of the abyss adventure once for tier four characters. And one character got disintegrated twice <laughs> in the combat and still came back fighting. So yeah, just, just let it fly yeah. and let them be heroes and bounce back. I remember uh, season seven, the, uh, AL season seven, the high level games where there was doing the meteor swarms, two of them in a round, like 150 damage each. And, you know, the death wards protected the party and the, uh, the rogues that could avoid completely the damage protected the party. It's just amazing what can be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that you're both saying, and yet D&D makes it easier at high levels. I wonder if Daggerheart or MCDM will do the same. So interestingly, both of these systems only go up 10 levels, right? Are they are they cheating to avoid how hard it is to keep going up and up and up in level? Are they just admitting defeat and saying, well, no, we can, we can do a spread over 10 levels, but we can't do it over 20 or 30? Are they just finding the sweet spot? And yeah. Start, start at third and go to 13th or something like that, right? In D&D. &D. Yeah. 
although I do love the barely surviving adventures uh, first level. Okay, what else you got next on your list there, David? Okay, well, I don't have a lot left here. We can we can mention uh, ability scores just for a minute. Okay, Both yeah, let's talk about that have ability scores that pretty closely parallel what you've got with D&D, even though the names are changed and generally to make more apt terms. So for example, both systems replace charisma with presence and that term removes the sort of implication of calmliness that, um, that used to come with charisma and just leaves the idea of that being your force of personality. So it's more apt. Uh, Daggerheart makes a second interesting revision. It replaces dexterity with two scores, agility and finesse. In D&D, at least in the current edition, dexterity is too valuable. So everyone pick builds quick characters. And some of the options that you might pick for your PC uh, that are viable or best uh, just aren't, aren't as good. Uh, characters lose a little bit of variety. But by that's an interesting take, and what they don't have is uh endurance or constitution, right? Exactly they just have that hit points, right? And endurance or constitution is another trait that's overvaluable in DD. So, every DD character, when they can set their scores, picks to have a high constitution, it doesn't distinguish any character from any other, they've all got good constitutions. Um, yeah. And that makes them a little less distinct because there's no value in having a low constitution. Instead, Daggerheart just sets hit points based on a character's class and maybe some other factors. I, I can't remember. Um, it was basically their class. Some subclasses could change it. And then with your experience, you could change it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the different thresholds that you have. And then your hit points, your hit points can go up and your thresholds can go up both. I don't know how Dagger Heart handles the equivalent of what might be a constitution save. Yeah, did Dagger Heart have saves at all? I mean, we we're mm -hmm. only doing a first level adventure. I don't recall anything that was like a save. I don't remember anything like that, but yeah. I could be completely missing on that. Now, I think they're doing the same thing with MCDM. I mean, initially they had endurance, but I think they're talking about removing endurance on MCDM as well. Now, like you're saying, in D&D... The difference between an 18 con and a 10 con is enormous at 10th level. It's 40 hit points at 10th level, which is huge. Shadow Dark gets away from that by only giving you the hit point modifier at first level. Um, so a huge con is not going to be swingy. And D&D kind of did the same thing, where it was only up to a maximum, I think, of plus 3 modifier instead of plus 4, plus 5, plus 6, etc. And also only up to 10th level. And then it was a set hit points after that. So yeah, you're right. Con's definitely a problem, and Dex is definitely a problem, and so it's kind of uh, elegant to fix that by getting rid of Con and making two different Dex scores. Yeah, it's a good approach. Yeah, and and it's the sort of advantage they can have by not making a fifth edition variant, but instead starting with a clean slate and yeah. doing new systems that try and work in similar play space. Yeah. Well, good. You want to wrap it up there? Yeah, sounds I good. That, I, I'm I'm loving playing these games. I can't wait to see the next iteration of Daggerheart, next iteration of MCDM. I'm glad that they're all really different because then there's lots of stuff to steal from, right? Absolutely. Lots of different ideas to take and steal and use in your favorite game, whatever game that is. So uh, thanks, for, thanks everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye, folks. <laughs>